In this lecture, we're going to talk about polyostotic tumors or multiple bone tumors that all look alike. Just a fancy way of saying the same thing. So um, we've talked about in some of the other lectures how you come up with a reasonable differential diagnosis based on what a tumor looks like based on its location, based on its morphology, based on its matrix, based on any aggressive features it may have. And those are all going to help us uh, in talking about polyostotic things as well. Also, however, when you see a polyostotic lesion, uh, you're all going to have a separate differential diagnosis because it's a limited list of things that are um, liable to give you a polyostotic uh, lesion. So we'll go through both benign and malignant processes uh, that will give you a polyostotic uh, tumors. We can really break these down into whether they're benign or malignant. Now, by far and away, the most common things that you're going to see on a day-to-day -day basis are malignant polyostotic things, and they're usually going to be METs or multiple myeloma. You see these day in, you see these day out. Uh, they're super common. They're by far the most common tumor you're likely to encounter in your practice. Uh, and a lot of the other things we're going to talk about on the benign polyostotic list are much rarer, and you, you may not ever run across them at all. Um, but uh, at least we'll hopefully have heard of them. So uh, we'll run through some of the more common benign polyostotic things and then just briefly talk about the malignant things, which is uh, pretty uh, straightforward, really. All right, so this is a pretty um, good list of things that are going to give you benign polyostotic lesions. Uh, I think if you were familiar with all the things on this list, you wouldn't have uh, any problem approaching uh, multiple polyostotic uh, lesions, which were benign. So what are they going to be? So certainly fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia is not that uncommon, uh, and there are polyostotic forms of fibrous dysplasia. Multiple enchondromas, a uh, much rarer condition. Um, certainly a single solitary enchondromas are pretty common in themselves, but the multiple enchondroma syndromes are uh, quite rare, um, um, but we'll talk about those. Multiple osteochondromas. Uh, so again, a single osteochondroma is not an uncommon lesion. Multiple osteochondromas or hereditary multiple exostosis uh, is a uh, much uh, less common um, disease. Non-ossifying fibromas, again, these are single non-ossifying fibroma is a pretty common thing. Uh, this will crop up, but it's pretty rare to have uh, multiple non-ossifying fibromas. But nonetheless, there are conditions where you do develop those. Brown tumors uh, associated with hyperparathyroidism, um, that's probably not so uncommon as hyperparathyroidism is a pretty uh, common uh, condition. Um, so you can see brown tumors associated with those. Multifocal osteomyelitis, uh, again, infection can mimic bone tumors and it's going to be on many of your differential diagnoses for um, other bone tumors. And so you can certainly have uh, multiple areas of osteomyelitis. Uh, and then Langerhans cell histiocytosis, or EG. Um, is uh, pretty rare, but will also appear as a multiple lytic lesion as a polyostotic condition. Malignant polyostotic conditions, as I said, are pretty straightforward. It really just boils down to, uh, is this a metastasis of some sort? Uh, and if so, can we maybe think what it could be based on how it looks? Uh, and then a multiple myeloma. Um, those are the main things. Other things, like lymphoma, leukemia, uh, these could do it as well, but um, Mets and myeloma are, are by far and away the, the most common uh, malignant polyostotic conditions. These aren't really bone tumors. Um, these are just kind of miscellaneous things um, that can kind of look, you know, that are bone abnormalities or bone lesions, not really a bone tumor per se, but um, they are, because there can be multiple of them, uh, we'll just talk about them in here. Um, so hemangiomas, uh, hemangiomas are, are pretty uh, common, just kind of incidental findings, but you can have conditions where you have multiple hemangiomas. Osteopoikilosis is a, a rare condition where you have basically multiple bone islands scattered throughout the, the uh, skeletal system, as you can see here. It's kind of one of these things would easily characterize as a bone island, and they have multiple of them. So osteopoikilosis uh, is a type of skeletal dysplasia where you have multiple bone islands, uh, as is melariostosis, another skeletal dysplasia where you have um, abnormal sclerosis of the bone, which uh, goes along sclerotome. So we'll talk about some of those. All right, so we'll just go through these one at a time, our benign polyostotic conditions. 
uh, fibrous dysplasia is the, the first one we'll talk about. So polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, uh, if you remember when we talked about uh, a monostotic fibrous dysplasia, fibrous dysplasia, it tends to be a, a long lesion in a long bone. It tends to be a lytic in appearance. Um, and it's often associated with um, weakening of the bone and you'll get bowing abnormalities as you can see here. In this patient with polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, you have this geographic lytic lesion which is affecting a long segment nearly the entire tibia and also a shorter segment of the fibula uh, and it's creating uh, these bowing abnormalities in both the tibia and fibula. And these bowing abnormalities are a classic uh, of fibrous dysplasia with this underlying lesion. I uh, will go back just to show you this one because uh, this was a picture also of fibrous dysplasia, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. And you can see it's affecting multiple bones in the pelvis and also the proximal femur. Uh, the proximal femur is a favorite location for fibrous dysplasia. And this is giving you one of your classic shepherd's crooks deformity. Uh, the, the femur is bowed and, and uh, not normal in morphology. And it looks like an old gnarled wooden um, stick that a shepherd walks around in in the ancient Athenian hills or something like that. So, uh, so shepherd's crook deformity in uh, polyostotic uh, fibrous dysplasia. Two of the conditions which are associated with polyostotic fibrous dysplasia are uh, McCune Albright syndrome and Mazur Brown syndrome. Uh, McCune Albright syndrome is uh, found in girls, uh, it's associated with precocious puberty. Um, and cafe au lait spots, and they'll have um, a polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. Uh, and the other one, Mazabrow syndrome, is again a polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, uh, but this one also is found with soft tissue myxoma. So if you see somebody with uh, multiple lesions that look like fibrous dysplasia and a soft tissue lesion uh, it's near adjacent, um, then it's a good bet that that's a myxoma, and this patient has a Mazabrow syndrome. Multiple enchondromas, so again, a single enchondromas are, are common, benign lesions, often in the hands. Um, multiple enchondromatoses uh, is a rare condition. Um, some of the enchondromas in multiple enchondromatoses can look a little uh, more irregular than just kind of a, your typical solitary benign enchondroma. As you can see here, this patient has multiple uh, of these lytic lesions that are involving long segments of the, the third uh, metacarpal and phalanges and also the uh, fourth uh, proximal phalanx right here. Um, these can occur not only in the hands and feet, but also in the lung bones and uh, in the pelvis and uh, uh, pretty much anywhere in the skeletal system. Um, why do we care about multiple enchondroma syndromes? Well, um, the main reason is because these patients are more likely to develop uh, malignant degeneration of uh, one of these enchondromas into a chondrosarcoma. Now, it's still pretty rare. The exact number, depending on who you read and what you look at, is kind of variable, maybe ranging from like 5 to 15% chance of malignant degeneration. Um, so that's why we care about these patients with multiple enchondromatoses. Uh, now, there are two uh, syndromes uh, that are associated with multiple enchondromas. One of them is Olier syndrome. Uh, one of them is Mifuchi syndrome. Uh, the Mifuchi syndrome is associated with soft tissue hemangiomas. So you may see phlebolis in the soft tissues from the uh, soft tissue hemangioma. Uh, and it's thought that Mifuchi syndrome has a slightly higher risk of malignant degeneration than Olier's syndrome. Multiple osteochondromas. Um, this is another polyostotic process. Uh, again, a single osteochondroma, uh, which, if you remember, is just kind of an outgrowth or an exostosis off the bone. And we can look at it and say and see the continuity between the cortex and the underlying marrow. And that is going to allow us to confidently suggest that this is an osteochondroma. Um, so a single one, pretty common. Multiple ones is pretty rare. But again, why do we care about multiple osteochondromas or the syndrome which is known as hereditary multiple exostosis or sometimes you may hear it called multiple hereditary exostosis. Um, we care about these because again, the risk of malignant degeneration is much higher than in a solitary osteochondroma. So uh, the numbers were very little bit, but it's going to be in the neighborhood of 100 to 1,000 fold more malignant risk of degeneration than in a patient with just a single solitary uh, osteochondroma. 
Uh, you can see in this patient here about the knee, there are these multiple osteochondromas, kind of a sessile one and maybe a pedunculated one off here in the uh, distal femur, and there's uh, one we're not seeing very well <clears throat> in the more proximal fibula. Uh, they share all the characteristics of a normal osteochondroma in that they're in continuity with the cortex and the underlying marrow. Uh, one of the interesting um, things about multiple hereditary exostosis is that if you see one or you maybe see two somewhere else in the body and you want to know if this patient really has this syndrome, uh, a good bet is to look at the knee. So image the knee, get a radiograph of the knee. If they have them about the knee, you're done. It's a slam dunk. They have the syndrome. For whatever reason, they tend to occur about the knee. Um, and this is uh, an autosomally dominant uh, associated um, syndrome. Uh, so one of the things that's also good to know about multiple osteochondromas is how do you know when one has gone bad? Um, and there's a couple ways to know. Um, certainly clinically uh, is one way, is a fair enough way. So if a patient is having pain associated with the osteochondroma, then that's something you can actually worry about. Now it may turn out that pain is related to uh, another process or if the osteochondroma is bumping up against a neurovascular bundle and causing pain because of that or causing uh, osteoarthritis or joint problems um, uh, because of the altered movement or altered bone growth, but certainly pain is one thing to think about. Uh, other things to consider is has this lesion grown? So now as a child or as a developing uh, skeletal person, um, they're allowed to grow just like the rest of your bone, but once you've stopped growing, once your growth plates are fused, the osteochondroma shouldn't be growing, so any growth after that fact is worrisome. Um, Radiographically, uh, we can look at the cartilaginous cap. Um, these lesions are associated with a cartilaginous cap. That's the chondroma part of the osteochondroma. Um, as you go into adulthood, the cartilage cap tends to regress and goes away. Um, but we can look at it either on CT or MR. Uh, and if that cartilaginous cap is, is quite large, and uh, people have picked a number of like two centimeters on average to use, um, if it's bigger than that, one will start worrying about uh, malignant degeneration as well, too. So multiple uh, osteochondromas, autosomal dominant syndrome, um, higher risk of malignant degeneration. So these patients are often placed in a surveillance program of some sort. Multiple non-ossifying fibromas. So the single non-ossifying fibroma is pretty straightforward. We'll see those not uncommonly in uh, kids or young adults, often in the tibia. Uh, remember, these are eccentrically or cortically based lesions. They're uh, geographic with a narrow zone of transition and a sclerotic border. Just like we see here, uh, this uh, eccentrically located elliptical lesion, which is uh, uh, narrow zone of transition and has a sclerotic border, um, maybe slightly cortically based as well. Um, so typical non ossifying fibroma or fibrosanthoma, whatever you want to call it. There's another one here in the proximal tibia and another one in the proximal fibula. Um, so there is a rare syndrome associated with multiple non-ossifying fibromas, which is known as Jaffe uh, Kambanachi, um, and this is associated with cafe au lait spots, and, and sometimes you'll see multiple non-ossifying fibromas in uh, neurofibromatosis type 1. Um, so uh, there's no malignant risk uh, of these uh, non-ossifying fibromas, it's just a syndrome that's noticed. It's quite rare, and you're probably never going to see it, but uh, just so you've heard of it. Brown tumors uh, are brown, not really a bone tumor per se. Again, they're really just a collection, uh, a focal collection of osteoclasts, which are chewing up the bone and, and leaving uh, underneath it this kind of fibrovascular tissue and demineralizing the bone because of the dysregulation of the osteoclast. So brown tumors are associated with hyperparathyroidism, uh, and often you'll see multiple of them. One of your clues that you're dealing with a brown tumor is to look for other manifestations of hyperparathyroidism, uh, which are often pathomonic, such as in, in this patient right here, we see subperiosteal resorption along the radial aspect of the middle second and third uh, phalanx, as well as some band-like uh, resorption of the distal phalanx here, this kind of band-like resorption, this distal aqual osteolysis, which is very typical of hyperparathyroidism. Uh, and if you saw uh, a lytic lesion in this patient in the bone, then you could pretty much uh, say with confidence that that was a brown tumor. So that's going to be a clue that you're dealing with uh, uh, brown tumors. Just look for other manifestations of hyperparathyroidism. 
infection. So uh, again, you can have a single focus of infection or you can have a multifocal uh, osteomyelitis. Um, there's an entity called recur chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis, um, usually seen in uh, younger patients, or you can have a uh, multifocal osteomyelitis associated with uh, fungal infections, tuberculosis, or uh, um, usually less likely to be a pyogenic bacterial infection that is possible as well, too. Uh, this is a patient right here who has this permeated lesion in the distal radius, and there's a periosteal reaction, not only about the radius, but uh, about the ulnar. This was a, a focal area of infection, um, but there could be uh, other areas of, of infection and a multifocal infection. So that's something to consider as well. Langerhans cell histiocytosis, or, or EG, uh, another rare condition. Uh, you'll see this in children or young adults. Um, you're not going to mention this in a differential in older adults because it just doesn't really occur. Um, so this is something to think about when you have a patient in the right age range and you have multiple lipid lesions. As you can see here, there's one, uh, right, there are multiple in the vertebral bodies. This patient had other ones uh, also throughout their skeletal system. Uh, and this was a young woman with uh, EG. Sometimes EG can look very uh, aggressive and, uh, and scary and, and mimic uh, you know, something like a lymphoma or other more aggressive uh, uh, process. All right, malignant polyostotic conditions really, again, just boils down to uh, metastasis uh, and multiple myeloma. Those are going to be the main things that are going to do it. Uh, this was a Technetium 99M MDP bone scan in a patient with multiple uh, skeletal abnormalities, multiple skeletal metastasis and soft tissue metastasis. Their primary in this case was actually an osteosarcoma that was here in their proximal tibia, uh, and then it had metastasized all over. Um, but certainly in bats myeloma, uh, myeloma usually tends to occur in adults over 50 or so, not so much before then. So if they're uh, under 50, you may leave myeloma out of your, your differential. Um, metastasis that like to be expansile and lytic tend to be uh, thyroid and renal, so that's something to think about too. If you see multiple expansile um, lytic uh, lesions uh, from metastasis, uh, things that could do that are thyroid and renal metastasis. All right, so the miscellaneous conditions, uh, hemangiomas, osteopoikilosis, and melary osteosis. Uh, hemangiomas, hemangiomas, you see these in the spine uh, all the time. They have this typical corduroid appearance, as you see right here in this vertebral body. They're benign, they're incidental findings, these don't mean anything. Um, but you, you can have conditions where you have multiple hemangiomas throughout the bones. Uh, it's uncommon, but uh, possible. There's no malignant potential to any of these. Osteopoikilosis is a skeletal dysplasia where you have uh, multiple bone islands, uh, as you can see in this patient right here, multiple sclerotic foci scattered throughout the, the pelvis. These were all just um, bone islands from osteopoikilosis. Um, occasionally, if a patient has like an underlying prostate cancer or something uh, and you're worried that these are metastasis, it's reasonable to perhaps take them to do a bone scan to see if they have any activity uh, within them. Uh, the activity is variable on bone scan, but they tend not to have much uptake on them. So, One other interesting uh, factoid about osteopoikilosis is these patients are prone to keloids, which may not affect you that much, but if they're undergoing a procedure of some sort or if you're doing an intervention on them, that's nice to know. Um, try to minimize scar in these patients if they have uh, osteopoikilosis. Melariostosis is a skeletal dysplasia, uh, which runs along scleroterms. Scleroderms. Uh, Here you see these uh, sclerotic bands, kind of uh, in cortical thickening, extending along the humerus. It's also the sclerosis of the uh, scapula. Um, typically, malariostosis is described as a, a dripping candle wax appearance uh, going along the bone, and you can see that either isolated in one bone or in multiple bones as well. Too, there's no malignant potential to malariostosis. Uh, but it can be painful and can cause problems if it crosses uh, joint spaces or um, rubs against a neurovascular bundle or something.